My name is Ruben Magdaleno. I'm the campus pastor for Parker Campus, and this is my wife, Joanna. Uh, Ruben and I met uh, when I was 17. He was 18 years old. We liked each other. I thought he was kind of cute, but we, we just were friends. And then about three years later, we reunited and we were inseparable. Uh, we started to date and uh, the relationship moved pretty quickly after that. Moved in together and uh, got pregnant, had a baby. So we basically did everything backwards. The one thing my wife didn't know though is that I was living a very selfish life. Um, I had a drug addiction the whole time throughout our whole marriage. I didn't really know how to lead. I didn't really know how to be a father or a husband. Um, I was living a very, very selfish life. When I couldn't hide it no more, that's when everything unraveled. And eventually I hit rock bottom. I didn't know obviously that he, that he was struggling with drugs. And so I found myself doing everything in the home, taking care of everything. I was the one leading the family and wearing the pants, so to say. I thought I had everything under control at home. Um, and I didn't. So when I found out, it completely shattered me. I mean, it completely broke me when all of this came out. I thought, how did I miss this? We've been married for five or six years. We were into our marriage and it, it, it turned out the entire time he was on drugs. So after six years of hiding this addiction, instead of stopping clean and confessing it, I invited her to use with me. I accepted that invitation to use drugs with him and very shortly after, uh, everything just crumbled. Because of the drug use and the addiction, we were both unemployed. Two months later, uh, we were both homeless, homeless living on the streets because of the drug use with our three sons. Eventually that will lead us into jail and prison. I went to my mom and my stepdad's house where I had my kids and because I went there, I knew they went to church and I went to church with them on a Wednesday ser service. I gave my heart to Christ and for the next 10 months, I really, really got closer to God. After 10 months, the warrants went out for my arrest. And so I went into prison or to jail as a Christian. When he got out of jail, uh, I was still in my addiction. Uh, he was, I could see obviously the evidence that something had happened. Something had happened in my husband I knew that there was a change. I knew that there was just something different. And I resented him instead of being happy for him. I was obviously committing crimes to support my habit. And I went to jail. And when I went to jail, I actually gave my life to Christ there. And I fell on my knees and I just cried out to God. And I, and I just said, if you're real and you'll, you know, I'll give, I'll give my life to you. I'll give my life to you, I'll serve you, but please restore my family. Even though I knew there was no hope, no chance, at this point, I had started a relationship with another person. As a Christian, it was kind of hard for me because even though she had this relationship, I really didn't know what to do. So I did cry out to God and I asked him, what do, I, what do you want me to do? Your word says that if there is sexual immorality, that I have the right to divorce. The pain was a lot and uh, I remember it was a point where I sat back and I did realize that she had been sober. It's been over a year now, she had been sober. And God just really impressed in my heart about forgiveness. And I remember just thinking, wow, you forgave me for everything that I did. How come I can't forgive her? That became our journey towards redemption and uh, I should say restoration. We didn't know what it was like to serve God and be sober together. And because I had taken the role of leading the family before, I thought that that's what I had to do now. And that was not the case. He was not having it. Uh, when I got out, he was like, nope, I'm gonna take care of this. I'm gonna do that. And at first I was a little bit like, wait a minute, I'm the one that does that. But it was a little bit of relief for me that I didn't have to wear that pressure or, the, or, or have that pressure of leading. And I also saw him differently. I respected him so much more because he did take that lead. And because I knew that he was following God, I knew that I could trust where he was leading our family to.
Well, today we continue in our sermon series, Created For. And we've been looking at what the Bible says you and I were created to do. We're going to be on page 178. If you don't have a Bible, you can reach underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 178. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is where we're going to be. And if you don't have a Bible at your house, I want to encourage you, take that Bible with you. If somebody tries to stop you, hit them in the head with the Bible and take it with you. It's okay. We want We want you to have it. We want you to read it. We want you to begin to apply it to your life because we really believe that if we read God's word and apply God's word to our lives, he will change us. Today we talk about what we are created for in the area of worship. You and I were created to worship. Have you ever seen a baby that just has learned to pull themselves up? They're not walking yet. They're not toddling yet. They're just kind of pulling themselves up. And if you've ever seen a baby do that, when music comes on with a beat, it's interesting to see what the baby will do. Oftentimes what our four daughters did when they would pull themselves up and music would come on that had a beat, they would begin to drop. You know, they'd start rocking back and forth to the beat. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we've all seen that happen. And we never taught our babies how to do that. We never taught our babies how to dance like that. Or for that matter, I don't know that my wife and I had ever demonstrated dancing in front of our girls. We were too tired. We didn't do it. But the babies automatically start moving to music. And I think that's interesting. And I actually think that there's a reason behind that. And I really think it's because God has wired us to worship. And for thousands of years, worship and music have gone hand in hand. There's something powerful about worship music that can cause a person who is emotionally stubborn to be moved to tears as a result of the music. That worship music can sway the heart of somebody who's refusing to follow Jesus. Then all of a sudden, God opens up their heart through the music and through the lyrics and begins to speak and change their life. Worship music can cause somebody to make a recommitment or or cause a person to trust in God more. Worship can help restore relationships and restore marriages and restore families, even help rescue a person from sin. Worship is powerful in the life of an individual and you and I were created to do worship. God said in Isaiah 43, 21, I have formed these people for myself. They will praise me. Even if a person rejects God in this life, they will praise him. Even if they refuse to become a follower of Jesus in this life, God's purpose for them is that they will praise him. Romans 14, 11, the apostle Paul wrote, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, every tongue will confess and give praise to God. When will that happen? You and I know people that have rejected the gospel. You and I know people who have rejected the truth. When will that individual praise him? Well, unfortunately and sadly, it happens too late. It's after they die, uh, when it's too late to surrender their lives to Jesus, when they cannot enter into heaven because they rejected forgiveness. When they pass from this life and they stand before God, that is when the reality of a creator God that offered forgiveness and grace, it's going to hit them hard. They will fall to their knees and they will worship God and say, yes, you are the truth. You are the King. You are Lord. And sadly, that is too late. But that fact alone demonstrates what you and I were created to do, which is worship. And if you and I were created to worship, And as we talk about marriage and we talk about family, then it stands to reason that cultivating true worshipers is the purpose of every marriage. That's what you and I are to do as we're looking at raising our children. We're talking about raising worshipers, cultivating true worshipers. Now, 
we had gardens growing up in Bumpus Mills, Tennessee. Raise your hand if you grew up in Bumpus Mills, Tennessee. We had gardens growing up and many of the fruits and vegetables that we ate as kids came from our gardens. Tomatoes and asparagus and green beans and carrots, potatoes, corn, watermelon, all that stuff we grew in our gardens. Every spring we tilled the ground, we used hoes and rakes to make the dirt soft. We had sections for every plant. Now, I always thought that planting the seeds was the easiest, even though it involved like tilling up the ground. I thought that was the easiest part of the whole gardening process. I was excited. I like to see the seeds take root. I like to see them sprout. But anything more than that about gardening, I hated. That is where my joy for gardening completely ended. From that point on, it became a chore. It became laborious. We had to water the plants every day. We had to weed the plants every day. We had to inspect the plants every day. We had to make sure that bugs weren't eating the leaves every day. The mosquitoes would bite. The wasps would sting. The humidity was high and the sun would burn. Chiggers would get underneath my skin and I would scratch and itch. And those weeds kept on growing. They would grow overnight. Clumps of crabgrass would grow overnight. I hated that part, but I loved the harvest part. I love when the fruit was ripe. I love when the tomatoes were ripe. I love when the vegetables were ripe. I would go into the garden with a salt shaker and just pull those red tomatoes off the vine and sprinkle a little salt on, take a bite. Boy, it was fantastic. The cucumbers were great. The beans were sweet. The watermelon was juicy. Now the asparagus was still gross and it made my pee stink and I still never, under, you know, <laughs> never understood that. But if we were not consistent and we were not intentional about gardening, the weeds would overgrow the garden. They would choke out the plants that had taken root. Your children are plants that God is going to harvest. Your children are the plants that God is going to harvest. He created them for worship. He created our children to know him personally, to experience him in this life before they go on to the next. And God has outlined our role as parents in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses five through seven. God said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Now that is, that is every parent's role. That is each person's role. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you have kids, whether you're married or not. That is our role to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then God goes on to instruct his people how to raise their children to worship him. In verse six, he said, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Parents, our goal is to raise our kids to follow God in worship. Now we all understand when I talk about worship, we're not just talking about worship music, although I think that we need to talk more and more about the power of worship music and how important it is, but we're talking about a lifestyle of obedience. That's what genuine worship is, to, to become that living sacrifice to God that we're denying ourselves, we're taking up our cross and we're following him daily. Yet, you and I as parents were placed with an incredible responsibility to help cultivate our kids and point them to Jesus in such a way that they accept Christ as their savior and they worship him with their lifestyle. But it amazes me how easily I lose sight of the goal that God has for me as a parent. I, I don't know about you, but I get so caught up sometimes in the, uh, in the season of goals or in the short term, I get caught up in the temporary. You know, some of my goals when my kids were little was just to get them to stop biting other kids in nursery. 
Right? That was a goal. Okay, please don't bite anymore. How are we going to solve this problem? And I'm not focused on the ultimate goal of creating worshiper. I just want her to stop biting other people. Or maybe it's potty training them before they turn the age of two uh, to stop picking their nose in public. You know, little goals that we all have as parents that we say, yes, thank you, Lord, we did it. Or maybe it's playing sports or maybe those future goals that, you know, Christy and I are not yet there when it comes to parenting our kids. None of my children have graduated from high school yet. That's one of our goals. We want them to graduate from high school. Uh, then we want them to go on to college and graduate from college. We want them to get a job. We don't want them to be idiots, right? We want them to get married. We want them to give us grandchildren at some point in the future. But I will lose sight of the long-term goal that God has, the eternal goal that God has, if I only focus on my part, my responsibility, what I'm supposed to do. If I only focus on the immediate, I'm going to lose sight of the eternal in raising my kids. Our ultimate goal, regardless of their education, athletic ability, intellectual capacity, natural talents and gifts, is to cultivate worshipers. We are to raise kids who love Jesus. Now, there's nothing we can do about their heart. We can't make them love God. We can't make them follow Jesus. But what we have to do as parents is to provide an environment. We have to be responsible for three essential things to help do everything we can to point our kids to Jesus. And there are three essentials that I want to give to you today that we must begin to implement in our homes. The first of the three essential essential is this intentionality intentionality Paul said to, to the Ephesians he said so be careful how you live don't live like fools but live like those who are wise now here's what's great for, for me I, I consider myself I fall into the fool category quite a bit but I can practice how the wise look and I can live like a wise person. People will think I'm wise if I do this. He said, don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Are you as careful and intentional as you should be as a parent. Now, I'm not talking about helicopter parenting. I'm not talking about not letting your kids climb the monkey bars because you're afraid that they'll fall down or you're afraid that they'll break your arm or, 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 or just hovering around them and trying to keep them from danger. I'm not talking about that. I, I am talking about being careful to make the most of every opportunity with your child. Now, Again, Christy and I do not have this parenting thing figured out. Many of you are far wiser. We could learn so much more from you. But there are a couple things that we are very intentional about doing in our house. We're very intentional about our words. And we're very intentional about our music that we listen to. We, we intentionally use words that we speak to build up our kids and to encourage them not to tear them down. We choose to intentionally not make fun of our children. We choose not to call them names or put them down or point out things about them or their body or their abilities that might make them feel bad about themselves. We intentionally choose to laugh with them even when the jokes aren't funny. Uh, we we ch intentionally choose not to laugh at them. We joke with them, but we don't make them the butt of the joke. We also have intentional conversations with our kids. My wife began this a few months ago and I'm blown away at how my children have responded to it. Every night as we eat our meal together around the table, Christy will ask the girls to share two roses and a thorn. And so what she asks the girls to do, instead of just simply asking, how was your day today? Christy says, what were your two roses from today? What were the things that re you really loved about today? What were the things that stood out to you? What made you laugh? What made you enjoy life today? What did you really uh, love that happened to you today? And then we say, hey, what sucked? What was your thorn? We don't use the word suck. What, 
What was terrible about today? What didn't you like? And you know what our girls do? One by one, they go around the table and they answer. They talk. We're getting conversation with our girls and we're not just having to say, how was your day? But we're asking something more intentional. What was good about your day? What did you enjoy about your day? And what was negative about your day? They share and they communicate specific things and we listen to them, we encourage them, we laugh with them. And not only are we intentional about our words and how we speak, but we're also intentional about the music in our home. Now, as a former youth pastor, I know and understand music has a major influence in the lives of kids. Music has a major influence in the lives of us as people. We know that music can help us love God's and love our kids more almost every morning at breakfast. I said almost, I didn't say every. Almost every morning at breakfast as the girls are getting up, we've got something streaming from Pandora, some type of worship music, whether it's Chris Tomlin or David Crowder or, or uh, some of the other newer, I can't think right now, my brain just stuck, uh, Lauren Daigle. We are listening to worship music. And you know what my girls are doing as they're coming down the hall and they're sitting down at the table? They're singing along. They're listening to the words of the song. They're singing about the greatness of God. They're singing about the redemption of man. They're singing about man's brokenness and the hope that we have in Christ. And they're singing those words together. And sometimes we listen to country music. But we're careful about the lyrics, right? Uh, if they start cussing or singing about making out with girls in bars, we stop the music and we go to something else. And one of the girls will inevitably, inevitably say, what were they talking about? What were they singing about? And we're like, ah, you know, just stuff and fast forward. Right now, my uh, daughter, Naomi, she's 10 years old. She loves Tim McGraw's old stuff. Like she loves his old music. And so we actually have a station on Pandora called Tim McGraw. This week, she and I were standing in the kitchen cooking and we were cooking dinner together and a song of his came on and I knew every word of it and I started singing it before I realized how much danger I was in because it was a song that Tim had written about his daughter growing up. And so I'm, I begin singing the words, kind of being silly and Naomi's watching me and I'm singing the words. I'm like, oh, this is gonna hurt emotionally. This is about to get bad. Some of the lyrics to this song were, when you were in trouble, that crooked little smile could melt my heart of stone. Now look at you, I turned around, you've almost grown. Sometimes when you're asleep, I whisper, I love you in the moonlight at your door. As I walk away, I hear you say, daddy, love you more. Someday some boy will come and ask me for your hand, but I won't say yes to him unless I know he's the half that makes you whole. He has a poet's soul and the heart of a man's man. I know he'll say that he's in love, but between you and me, he won't be good enough. And so I'm singing that song and Naomi looks up at me as I sing it. And then tears are now flowing from my eyes because I'm communicating this truth to my daughter right now. It doesn't matter what knuckleheaded, bobbleheaded Joe comes to my door. I'm going to say no because he's not good enough because that's how much I love you. He's just not going to be good enough. He's not going to be able to win your heart. And you deserve more. Man, she grabbed me, she hugged me, she held on to me, and Naomi is not affectionate. And just a few moments later, Christy came in the door and Naomi ran to her. And Christy was like, later on, what did you say to her? What were you doing to her? Why was she so upset? And I was like, you don't wanna know. <laughs> Be intentional to communicate to your children how much God loves them, whether it's through worship music, whether it's through scripture, whether it's through any opportunity that you have, be intentional about communicating your love for your children and God's love for your children. Secondly, consider your child's environment, okay? Consider the environment that you are raising your children in. The very healthiest of plants grow in the very best environments. We get that. But there are those rare occasions when we see that photograph or that picture or in person of a flower growing up through a crack in a pavement or in a sidewalk. But those are very rare. Where you see the most healthy plants 
is where there is healthy soil. Now, my childhood environment was a toxic environment that I grew up in. My dad was abusing my mom. My dad was abusing me. My dad screamed and yelled while drunk and we would often wake up with brand new holes in the walls, broken kitchen table chairs, flipped over cabinets. The environment that I grew up in was unhealthy and toxic. There was an incredible amount of tension between my brothers and sisters and myself. We never talked about the abuse and our anger. We instead lashed out at, at each other and drove each other away. But because Jesus found me and I became a follower of Jesus, uh, I, I am that flower growing up in the sidewalk. Now, it's a manly flower. It's not a pansy, but it's whatever manly flower you could think of. But some of you are that way too, aren't you? Some of you grew up in an environment that was unhealthy, that was not helpful. Some of you grew up in an environment where there was abuse and where there's a lack of trust or where there was a lot of violence. You grew up in a hurtful environment, yet here you are seeking God anyway. Why? Because God changed you. He's transforming you. He's giving you hope. He's giving you life. You see what life is like on the other side. And now you're clinging to the words of Jesus and you're looking to him for hope because you get how important and environment is you're doing all that you can to raise your kids in a great environment parents remember this you are the environment that your kids are growing up in you are the environment it's not only about music it's not only about television it's not only about their friends you are the environment Ephesians 6, 4, Paul said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. You see, there's two environments that Paul painted there. One is the environment of anger. The other is the environment that's growing up to know the Lord. And fathers or parents, we're responsible for that environment. It's very possible that every day, parents, you are the reason why your kids are singing worship songs. You are the reason why your kids are memorizing scripture. You are the reason why your kids are learning to be gentle and kind. And also, parents, it's very possible that you are the reason why there's bickering and fighting going on among your children. It's very possible that you are the reason why there's, there's a, a yelling and screaming and antagonism going on inside your home. If you are bickering with your spouse every day, your children are being provoked to anger as a result of the way that you're talking to your spouse. Change your tone, you change your environment. You know, I, spending time together as a family Parents, it's so important that we're investing, making the most of every opportunity that we are providing an environment that the kids can grow and thrive in. And part of that happens at the dinner table every evening. Uh, yesterday, I read a study from London. Uh, they did a study of 2,500 families in the UK, and they discovered that one third, one third of that 2,500 families were together for dinner but they sat in complete silence. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine sitting down with your family at dinner and nobody saying a word to each other? See, that's, that's tension. Parents, we're, we're responsible for the environment in which our kids grow up in. In fact, we are the environment. Make dinner time that tech-free time, right? Put down the phones, put down the tablets, put down the, all the other stuff and talk. And parents, you control that. You're the thermostat for your house. You control the environment. Talk with them, love on them, encourage them. And the final element as we talk about cultivating worshipers is consistency. Consistency, Deuteronomy 6, 7 you will teach them diligently to your children. 
Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Talk about God's word to your children and tell them how God's word is changing your life. Let them know that you do not have it all together. Let them hear you say the words to them, I'm sorry, daddy messed up. I'm sorry, your mom messed up. No, I'm just kidding. But be, be apologetic when we need to be. Be comforting when we need to be. Play worship music in your car and sing together. When you're praying for them at night, quote scripture and teach them to ask big things from a big God. Be consistent when you fuss at them too hard or when you lose your temper or you yell at somebody in front of you at the school drop-off. Tell your kids you were wrong. Be humble. Help your kids understand that you're imperfect as well. Because when we cast a shadow that we're perfect, our kids are going to grow up underneath this, this pressure that they need to be perfect. And when they mess up, they're not going to talk to you. Help them to understand that we're all sinners dependent upon God's grace and mercy. Point them to Jesus through God's word, through your flaws, through your mistakes, through your own need for grace. Because you will replicate what you demonstrate. You will replicate what you demonstrate. Many of us have mannerisms that we were passed down to us from our parents or our grandparents. We act the way we did oftentimes in correction or in discipline or instruction because that's what our parents did. That's how they treated us. But we've got to be very sensitive as followers of Jesus that we will replicate what we demonstrate. Are we raising worshipers? Well, are we a worshiper? Are we raising godly kids? Well, are we practicing godliness? Are we raising kids that put other people uh, before themselves? Well, are we doing that? And are we demonstrating that to our kids? Because there's nobody in this world that your children look up to more than you. You are their role model. There's none like you in all the earth. Our, our kids will become like us in many ways. So are you leading them to a lifestyle that is dependent upon Jesus? Do they see you applying God's word to your life? Now, maybe your kids are grown up and gone. Maybe you hear this sermon, you feel like you blew it. Maybe you feel like it's, uh, it's just too late to raise your kids now. You know what it's never too late for? It is never too late for an apology. It is never too late to call your adult child and say, I blew it. I messed up. It's never too late to ask for forgiveness and keep pointing your kids to Jesus. I'm so grateful for God's grace in my life. I'm so grateful for an opportunity to tell you a little bit about how Christy and I view parenting what we're intentional about and what we're really striving for in our home. But I hear, hear me as I say this, we're not there yet. We're working on it. But we hope and pray just as you do that how we live our lives points them to Jesus in such a way that our kids want Jesus in their life because they see how Jesus has affected our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you for the grace that you show to us in our lives. Thank you for the children you've entrusted to us. And Lord, while we know God, you know we are not perfect. We know and we believe and we are convinced that we are created for worship. That we've been created to worship you and we look to you. And we ask, oh God, that you would help us to be conformed to your image, not our image. Help us to show that type of grace to our friends, to our family. And Lord, as we think about our children, oh God, we need you to help us parent better. We need you to help us parent our children better. And Father, I pray for those in this room that still have children in their home. God, show them the way to raise a worshiper. Show them how to raise kids, pointing them to you. Help them to be vulnerable. Help them to be transparent. Father, help them to be courageous in their faith. 
Father, for those whose adult children have already passed on, Father, we, our adult children have already grown up, Lord, we pray that you would uh, give them the right words to say. If there's apologies that need to be made, God, we pray that their relationships would be reconciled and restored. And we thank you, God, that you are the God of grace and that you love reconciliation and you, you love restoration. So, Father, restore and reconcile relationships that are gone. In Jesus' name, amen.